Good afternoon, everybody. You guys fired up? We got this, right? Yeah? Um, well, I just wanted to, to say uh, thank you to Opportunity Nation and everybody here. I've been involved uh, for about three years in Opportunity Leader, and um, uh, the amount of excitement and joy it brings to my life to, to be part of this awesome group is um, un unrivaled. Um, I'm a 2013 Truman Scholar, a 50-ton Coast Guard Master Marine Captain, uh, and also the founder and executive director of an organization called Sail Future. And we work at the forefront of juvenile justice, and I am so happy um, that that issue got as much attention um, as it did today. Uh, we, we heard people from the business community who are supporting initiatives for, for those who are coming out of incarceration and using employment training to, to create pathways. And um, that's, that's a lot about what we do at Sail Future. Uh, we provide intervention programs for, for youth who, who are kind of caught up in a system um, that is, is still in many ways designed to fail them. And um, we work with kids. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite graduates is a young man named Rahim, uh, who in 11th grade uh, just stopped going to school. He was incredibly angry. Uh, and he fought um, at, at the quickest instance. And he just didn't know how to control his anger. And it led him to a lot of problems. Um, at the same time, he was one heck of a thief. He was a pretty slick guy. He could steal your iPhone and sell it to a pawn shop all within an hour. Um, he was, he's got some wit to him. But what I really wanted to, to talk about Rahim for um, is that he's not a bad kid, and he's a, a, an incredible example of, of the youth in our juvenile justice system today uh, who, who, we, who we tend to punish instead of, instead of provide treatment and rehabilitation for. Um, and, and that's not to say that's across the board. There's some incredible organizations here, um, youth ag advocacy programs, ROCA and others. A big shout out to, to you guys. You're doing incredible work on the ground, and uh, your mentors, and, 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 and you inspire us to, to be better and learn more, too. Um, but, but with Rahim, we, you really have to think about the root cause of his behavior. Uh, he was a 16-year-old kid living in a one-bedroom hotel room with his mom. And um, he didn't go to school because he was too embarrassed to let the bus pick him up at a, at a motel room. And he fought because he didn't know how to control his anger and manage the emotions he felt at home. It was incredibly toxic for him. And he stole because he didn't have any money for food. He didn't have any money to live off of. Um, that's not to excuse his behavior. Uh, but what I really want to point out that, is that kids in our juvenile justice system commit crimes because of the, the environmental hazards and circumstances they grow up in, not because they have some corrupt character that labels them as an evil person. And we really need to understand that if we're going to provide good, good services and, and crush this employment crisis and, and all the problems that we face as, face as it relates to opportunity. Um, you know, I understand Raheem pretty well. And I understand how the absence of hope breeds anger and how the absence of hope uh, can break someone's moral compass and lead them astray and to do things that they, they otherwise would never be proud of. Um, like Raheem, my upbringing wasn't easy. Um, and I, I, I didn't know how to cope with the chaos and, and the pain that I felt at home, um, just like he, didn't, he wasn't able to. Uh, I dropped out of school. Um, I wasn't as slick as Raheem was stealing iPhones, but I broke into people's homes. I stole people's um, cars, and uh, I got entrenched in the drug trade in a pretty deep way that um, was very hard for, for me to break out of. Um, our poverty, my mom and I, uh, is probably what drove most of my criminal behavior. That if we're going to talk about root cause, that would be it. Um, and, and we struggled just to, to keep a roof over our heads and, and food and food in our stomachs. And it was kind of a um, hierarchy of needs. And up until the point where it put both of our lives um, literally at risk, it kind of served that purpose. Um, and again, not to excuse my behavior. I don't. I'm not proud of the things that I've done, but they have made me who I am today. I remember, remember one morning I was sitting on the couch um, watching the Today Show, and I was wondering, where in the hell is Matt Lauer? And I know everybody else has been right there with me. <laughs> it's 6.30 in the morning, you get your cup of orange juice, and you're just like, all right, let's get this day started. And my day started with the front door crashing down off the hinges and a couple of guys with assault rifles and masks breaking into my house. And so I'm sitting there on the couch with this OJ and all of a sudden I get beat to the ground with assault rifles and have guns pointed at my head. And uh, fortunately my mom wasn't home and it was just me. Um, but I was 15 years old. Um, and that was, uh, that was quite a reality, uh, reality check for me. Uh, again, self-inflicted, I put myself in that position. Um, 
but it, didn't, it wasn't because I had a corrupted soul or bad character. You guys can all agree that I'm a pretty great guy. I can see it in your face. Um, but, but my behavior, these crimes, the activities I was involved in landed me in Florida's ju juvenile justice system for about two years. Uh, and in my time there, um, I was incredibly lucky. I never made it into the high, high, maximum risk, deep end residential facilities. They definitely threw the book at me, um, but I was lucky and I made it out here and I'm here today. And I don't say that to brag, uh, but I do say it to, to point out that, um, that that's kind of an anomaly these days. And the majority of my peers who, who I spent um, my time in juvenile justice programs are not here with us. They're not opportunity leaders. Um, and that uh, weighs pretty heavy on my heart. Uh, one of my really good friends is uh, going to spend the rest of his life in jail for murder. Another was not too long ago, just a month ago, um, shot several times in a drug deal gone bad. And um, he'll spend the rest of his life, his life paralyzed in a wheelchair. And um, he wasn't as lucky as I am. And I understand my privilege and, and how fortunate I am. Um, but I also can't accept that that's the reality. And uh, we've all got to do a lot more to make sure that we have more success stories coming out of the system than we have failures. Um, and that really begs the, yeah, let's clap, man. We got this. And, um, and later on, at the end of the day, you're going to hear someone kind of rally you guys and chant, we got this. And I want you all to promise me that when that time comes, you're going to be with me. Uh, and we're going to be rallying and cheering. We got this. So, so I expect that of you. Uh, but one of the most powerful, um, powerful conversations we can have is, is how do we hold kids accountable for, for their mistakes without destroying their futures? Our initial reaction as a society is to punish instead of rehabilitate. And we're just now sort of starting to make that turn and realize that, hey, jail doesn't work. We spend a lot of money on it. When we put kids behind bars, recidivism rates soar. Uh, we've got to do something different. But our our knee-jerk reaction is still to punish, and we've got a lot more work to do around that conversation. And I think back to my own experience in the system and some of the most powerful moments for me that, that led me to, to be here with you guys today are fairly simple. They were, they were words um, from people who never understood the power of their words and were working deep in the trenches, and I owe uh, my life to them in many ways. There was um, this incredible Trinidadian caseworker in a program that I was in named Miss Sharon. And uh, we had a really insane day at the program. There was a riot and everybody was fighting. And um, it was, I think, my first or second day there. So I was doing intake. And she looked at me. She was like, honey, you don't belong here. <laughs> and um, you, you would think that you would hear that all the time as a, as a kid in the system. You have people coming in to inspire you and tell you you're different, whatever else. But um, whether other people had said it or not, that was the first time I believed it. And that was the first time that someone gave me hope. Just very simple words. And that hope gave me um, the inspiration to sort of start making some changes and, and get on that very slow track to, to rebuilding my life. Um, and I, I, just a big shout out to Miss Sharon. She's, a, she's amazing. Um, and when I got out of the system and got back into a public high school, I was in a pretty bad spot. I was um, 16, almost 17 years old. I had a 0 0.6 grade point average and no high school credits to speak of. And so when I went back into this high school, the guidance counselor looked at me and she said, hey, you know you can still graduate and you can still go to college. And I'm sitting here looking at my academic record and transcript and I'm like, are you reading the same thing that I am? <laughs> um, and such a simple thing that she said, you can graduate from high school, you can go to college, inspired the heck out of me. It gave me hope. And she had no idea the impact of those words. She just said them. And uh, the, reason, the reason I say all this to you all um, is not because I need to. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to a choir that we're all a part of. Um, but what I did want to do is just kind of reinforce and uh, just kind of remind everyone of the power of your words and how some of those simple statements and conversations that you can have with someone who uh, is deep in the trenches can lift them up and give them the hope um, that they need to, to come back and, and really make something out of their lives. And I know each and every one of you guys do this, and I want to thank you for it. And I want you guys to think about those times that you've, you've said something like that to someone. And, um, and you, you have no idea what impact they made. Mrs. C and Ms. Sharon have no idea what impact they made. Um, and, and you guys should really be incredibly proud of yourselves. And I'm excited um, to now be on the direct service side of things and be kind of sharing, um, sharing in that work with you all. Um, I, one last thing I wanted to mention, uh, Rahim, that, that young man that 
uh, was great with the iPhones. Um, he, uh, he went on to complete one of our Sail Future programs and uh, he graduated from high school. He also got a full ride to go to college in California. And um, I, I saw a lot of myself with him when he, when he was angry and mad and stealing and I see a lot of myself in him now and I couldn't be prouder. And he's just one example. Um, we're, we're nearing our three year anniversary at, at Sail Future and um, and I'm proud to say that all of our students, not just Raheem, have graduated from high school or they're still enrolled, and um, not one of them has had uh, additional criminal justice system involvement. Uh, so we've got 0% recidivism. And um, <laughs> and again, uh, I just want to say that uh, I'm, I'm inspired and excited to be here. I think this is the greatest community we could, we, we could be a part of. We get it. And uh, I'm really happy that juvenile justice has kind of risen to the level it, that it has today because it's so important. Um, and we got this. Thank you.